the extent of that, so thank you very much indeed. Uh, we now have Kirk Smith, University of California, USA, who's going to talk about uh, the dangerous smoke in and around the house. Kirk. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, WHO uh, Geneva has been a leader in um, uh, re presenting to the world the impacts of household air pollution, I think starting about 35 years ago. And it wasn't, initially, you know, ambient air pollution was well recognized as a health problem, but it, uh, household air pollution was not. It wasn't until about 20 years ago, the first burden of disease assessments, that household air pollution came to the global scene, if you like, and was seen to be also a very significant form. Why was that? It was because the, I think because the environmental movements that began, that focused on um, the health effects and other problems of air pollution, came about mostly in developed countries and came about after the long transition, had, the transition had occurred in household cooking. There was nobody cooking with solid fuels in Los Angeles in the 1950s when the air pollution became an issue there. Nobody cooking in um, Europe at that time with solid fuels. So the, the currently developing countries, India, China, and Africa, and so on, are in a, a period of time in which they've got both modern sources of pollution, as significant sources as we see in India and China, but also have a remaining background of household air pollution from use of solid fuels for cooking. They are in a transitional state. So they're having both problems at once. And as we know now, also, the household air pollution actually contributes to the ambient air pollution. In the case of India and China, perhaps 30 percent of the ambient air pollution in each city or each country is due to households. So the two are inter, inter, interwoven now. So I'll uh, go through briefly the uh, evidence base for household air pollution. We, of course, um, uh, benefit from all the work done on ambient air pollution, but our problem is, is we have to measure the exposures in the households. Can't measure them with a single monitor. A single monitor in a city can measure maybe the air pollution level of a million or five million people. But in a household, you have to look at individual households to see what the exposures are in order to do the extrapolation from the ambient evidence. So we have a different class or different sort of evidence base uh, that is complementary to what we learn from outdoor air pollution. Uh, first of all, we define it as the burning solid fuels for cooking. And it's always compared to what? So we, we counterfactual, as it's called, is cooking with gas. Gas is not completely without pollution. But it's so much cleaner than using solid fuels that we use that as the comparison. So you can think about this. This is the health effects of not cooking with gas. Um, space heating and lighting are important sources of pollution in households, but it, currently we don't have the databases to include them in the burden of disease. So when you hear that um, uh, 3 million or 4 million people are dying prematurely from household air pollution, it does not include that portion that is affected by space heating or uh, lighting. It's called not, we don't call it indoor anymore because we realize that it's, it's kind of a misnomer. The pollution may start in the kitchen, but it soon goes outdoors, it comes back in the bedroom, goes next door, goes down the street, becomes part of general ambient air pollution. Calling it indoor makes it sound like you just get it outdoors, it'll fix it, but it doesn't. And indeed, even cooking outdoors causes exposure. As health people, we're concerned about exposure, what people actually breathe. And, they, and the men sitting outside waiting while their wife is cooking the food indoors, she gets the higher exposure, but they get exposure too. So we don't use the term indoor to, uh, to uh, describe this problem. And the problem is actually creating smoke near people. That's the problem. Well, of course, what's the biggest source of creating smoke near people is uh, tobacco smoking. And after tobacco smoking, this is the largest source of, uh, of air pollution exposure, household cooking. It's every household every day. There are other major sources of uh, exposure besides households, but it's the second largest after tobacco. And interestingly enough, it has solutions that are often within single agencies or a small set of agencies and a small set of technology program, um, groups that, to engage it. Much easier, in a sense, than the, uh, the large set of issues that have to be dealt with with ambient air pollution. So the three major solid fuels used around the world are wood, crop residues, and coal. Um, 
The trend of usage over time is not so great. You can see in the, these are WHO regions, the African region, uh, it's actually going up. There are more people using solid fuels every year. In the uh, Southeast Asia region, that's uh, where India dominates, you can see that it's about the same. It hasn't declined over time. And in Western Pacific, that is you know, dominated by China, it tends, has tended to decline. But overall in the world, there's been about 3 billion people. Now, there are more people using clean fuels, you and I, but they're the same number that have been using solid fuels. And given the trend in world history, I think it's fair to say it's more people that be using solid fuels for cooking than any time in human history. It's three billion today. After all, in 1950, there weren't even three billion people. So it's not a problem that's going away by itself. <clears throat> now, um, sorry, this figure didn't work, but the, uh, the, the big background figure is the, dif uh, the distribution of use of solid fuels. And you can see it's in the poor parts of the world. It's in sub-Saharan Africa and India and China, a little bit in uh, the Andes and the Central America. It is exactly the same pattern of poverty. The upper figure is a picture of poverty in the world. So this is one to one with poverty. Now we can feel good about that in the sense that we're helping the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world by working on household air pollution, but it also adds a lot of difficulty to doing the science. Because how do you know that the problem that you're looking at is due to the air pollution in the household or due to the poverty in the household? So a lot of the art and science of doing the studies is to try to extract the differences between the poverty impact on those households and the air pollution impact on those households. And you're never ever, ever quite absolutely sure in any one study that you've actually been able to d do that uh, separation completely. That's why you will rely on multiple studies and using multiple methods in different parts of the world. But um, it is true that it is one-to-one -one with poverty. Nobody in this room uses an open fire in their kitchen. And nobody in the poorest billion of the world uses gas in their kitchens. So it is a poverty issue. And the reason it's still around is that we have a lot of poor people in the world still. Now, some people think that wood smoke, it's mainly biomass smoke we're talking about, is natural. I mean, I like the smell of wood smoke. It reminds me of camping with my family and, you know, when I was a child. <laughs> well, unfortunately, <clears throat> Uh, while wood can be burned completely, it actually in a simple fire is not burned completely and uh, the kind of things that are in wood smoke, or here's a list of them, are very noxious materials. Um, here's a long list of uh, known toxic materials and you, some of your favorite things may be out at the end in the, in the italics, benzene, formaldehyde, methanol, uh, even dioxin has been measured in wood smoke. We, we often talk about one thing only. That is PM 2.5, it's up there called small particles up there, but that's only part of the mixture that's in wood smoke. It's a rather noxious mixture. And in fact, colleagues have shown that some of the biggest exposures to things like benzopyrene and benzene, which are often thought of as industrial pollutants, are actually also occurring in village households. But you can't study everything all at once, you can't measure everything all at once, and we tend to focus on PM 2.5, and that's because it's kind of the universal pollutant for studying health effects. It's what the ambient people use, it's what the cigarette people use, they call it tar, total um, aerosol residual, but it's tar on a filter, much like we measure particles. That's the metric that we can use across exposure categories. Um, but it is not, I want to remind you, it's not the only thing. And it's not clear that some of the health outcomes, for example, cancer, is actually best reflected by the particles. There are lots of chemicals in this mixture that are, all, that are known to be cause cancer, for example. So um, if you want to relate this to a, you know, a, a, a tobacco analogy, the wood cook, a typical cook fire releases about 300 cigarettes worth of smoke an hour. That's in terms of small particles, not counting all this other stuff. Now, cigarette smoke is not the same as wood smoke, but there are a lot of similarities. It has a many similar mixture of things, for example. It's not like she's smoking, first of all. It's not, the woman is not smoking cigarettes, 300 cigarettes. It's like having a whole bunch of, like being in a very smoky bar with 300 cigarettes an hour being smoked. Uh, the typical levels of pollution, here is a typical wood stove in India. Um, the standards are at the bottom and the typical indoor concentrations are up in the middle. You don't have to look at it too much to see that the, they're far above the standards. Now that is just during the cooking time, but if you 
divide that by five or 10 uh, by relative to the times, it's still very much higher. Now we tend to focus only on one thing, small particles. But remind, remember that, um, though the, for example, these three things on the right are known human carcinogens by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, cancer Category 1 carcinogens. So there are lots of other things in this smoke. It's an indicator pollutant. Um, this is the exposure situation. This is the oldest uh, picture we have of a woman uh, being having her air pollution measured during um, her using the oldest task in human history. I call it the oldest task because anthropologists use the control of fire as the definition of becoming human. Many animals use language. Many animals use tools. No animal controls fire except us. And these levels we, we measured back in 1981 are um, you know, very high, and we've done hundreds of studies since, they're similar around the world. So they're high, the high end of what the worst cities in the world have, uh, and it's of course 40% of the population of the world. Um, so how much, you've, I'm not gonna go through this, they're far above the WHO guidelines or the important standards around the world. Uh, we have four types of health evidence, hundreds of epidemiological studies that compare the health effects in households using clean fuels or cleaner cooking methods and uh, dirty fuels. Uh, sorry, uh, we have randomized control trials, which are often considered in the health world as the gold standard. We have a few of those that have been done so far, but they've been done with improved stoves. These are stoves that have less, slightly less pollution than the open fire, and they haven't shown much because the exposure reduction has not been high. Only one has actually shown something, and I'll show that in a minute. And then we have relied most recently on these integrated exposure response functions, which have come from outdoor air pollution studies and the smoking studies, to, to link the pollution from four different exposure types, and I'll show, show, illustrate that. And then we have lots of studies of biomarkers disease, blood pressure changes, changes in heart function, and so forth. So uh, here is a typical you know, group of uh, epidemiological studies that have been done. Um, this is for child pneumonia. Uh, they're all showing, mostly showing an effect. The summary results show a significant effect. Uh, here is from one of the uh, uh, randomized trials. It shows severe pneumonia uh, is, uh, shows an effect. The cleaner stove lowered rates of severe pneumonia, either whether uh, of various kinds of severe pneumonia. Um, the diseases that, as uh, Annette mentioned, the diseases that are thought to be associated with air pollution in terms of the burden of disease calculations are childhood pneumonia, and then a set of chronic diseases in adults. What we've added, perhaps, that the outdoor air pollution people don't have is cataracts because uh, of the higher exposures indoors. Um, they, we, we, in order to bridge across all of the exposure categories. We uh, link the outdoor air pollution studies with the household studies and with active smoking studies, and I'll show that, using PM2.5 as the link, even though we know it's not a perfect indicator of all the risk. And um, again, as compared with gas cooking. So lots and lots of studies have uh, gone into these integrated exposure response functions, including all the cohort studies and mentioned by by Annette, but also a range of other studies, depending on the outcome. And you get uh, curves like this that look like this. And so this is a very simple version of the curve. The outdoor air pollutions tend to be at the low level, although recently uh, this new Chinese study adds it to somewhat higher levels. We have the secondhand tobacco smoke studies, you know, ch children whose parents smoke, those pollution levels tend to be here. And then the smoking studies are way out there. You know, they're probably 50 meters out there. They're terrible exposures the uh, uh, smoking people get. But why do you do that? Why do you put the smokers in? Because otherwise, if you extrapolate these things, you get very high risks at these high exposure levels, which doesn't pass the laugh test. Nobody's going to believe that the air pollution levels uh, produce health effects that are higher than they're produced by smokers. So the smokers, we, we can ground at zero. Zero exposure means zero effect and we can ground it at high levels. This is this tool we use, and the household air pollution zone is right in here. So in the extrapolation is, if we find these effects, more and more effects of outdoor air pollution and secondhand tobacco smoke, nobody doubts the effects of smokers. Are you gonna find zero effects in between? You know, that we're interpolating this graph, not extrapolating it. You're not very, 
stretches uh, imagination that it would somehow go down to zero just for this level and go back up again. So this is the argument for household air pollution, uh, some of the health effects, particularly heart disease and stroke, which have not been studied in household air pollution settings because of the difficulties of, of um, uh, setting large getting exposure estimates for large populations. So this is the uh, way that the burden of disease estimates were done. We have some we have a lot of other secondary evidence like heart, bird, blood pressure and heart, heart function and so forth, but no actual heart disease studies. So these are what these um, things look like in more detail. Here's the one for pneumonia, which is, is informed by household air pollution. Here's the second hand tobacco smoke. Those are outdoor air pollution. And these are studies in, uh, from a randomized trial in Guatemala of actual household air pollution. This doesn't happen. Since babies don't smoke, we don't have an upper end that's anchored by smoking in the case of, but we have many studies of biomarkers of effect, blood pressure, there are more than two dozen studies that have shown health, blood pressure drops with changes in household air pollution, heart function, probably a dozen studies, lung function, a little hard to measure, but uh, many show an effect, urinary toxin levels, there are other types of biomarkers, many of them going on today. So a lot of secondary supporting evidence to these effects. So summary of the comparative risk assessment, that's what people call the burden of disease studies. One of the top risk factors in the world for ill health, most important environmental risk factors among all examined when the contribution to outdoor air pollution is attributed, when it is considered. Um, impact in adults is a growing fraction. It's still important for children, but pneumonia rates are dropping around the world, fortunately, because of um, better nutrition, vaccines, and better medical care. Um, not currently counted, though, or as I mentioned, are several very important diseases which we have given evidence for, it's particularly adverse pregnancy outcomes, birth outcomes in, in these settings, important source of outdoor air pollution, and much research is ongoing and called major multiple national uh, RCT programs in six or eight countries are going on now. We'll have much better evidence soon. But this business of not all diseases included is a, is, is a growing problem in this area. We have good evidence on, lung, uh, on birth weight, for example, some of it done in India recently in very good studies. Other cancers, cervical cancer, studies done in Latin America, upper respiratory cancer and so forth. Cognitive effects, IQ, pneumonia in adults, why just pneumonia in children, and tuberculosis perhaps, the studies are mixed. Can expect that the health effects over time will be found for nearly the, many, the same diseases that are found for smoking, lower risk levels, but the same diseases, why not? You're getting that an odd mixture of chemicals plus particles just with tobacco, just as you get with household air pollution. Um, so uh, these are some of the birth weight studies that have been done. Um, they're beginning to be pretty convincing that it is an effect on birth weight. Birth weight is a big problem in countries like India and many other countries that use a lot of household fuels. We think it is part of the reason of that. And finally, you know, you've, see, uh, you've seen pictures or you will see pictures like this in this meeting. This is the distribution of ambient PM 2.5 across the world. There's this band across Africa and, and Asia. Notice the high amount of the pollution in the Ganges River Valley and some of the big river valleys in China. Well, we now understand that about 30% of that actually comes from households. There are hundreds of millions of households burning dirty fuels three times a day out in those, in those river valleys, and they're creating a lot of pollution. You can't, so the point is, it's not that you can solve the outdoor air pollution problem only dealing with households, but you can't solve the outdoor air pollution without dealing with households. So needed, new full uh, burden of disease estimates with all the new disease categories, particularly birth outcomes, reframing of the risk categories. Everybody, you know, the, is household air pollution and ambient air pollution are framed differently, but household air pollution actually adds a lot to the outdoor air pollution. Uh, need to be reframed so that all the benefit gets uh, shown for household air pollution. Um, uh, and systematic assessment of the non-disease benefits are needed, like uh, Maria mentioned, uh, the, the time savings is huge in changing from uh, gathering biomass to using a, a modern fuel of some kind. And better studies, I believe, the charismatic outcomes, we keep saying there are cognitive impacts, there are actually no studies, or not enough studies in the households to make this point. But uh, we know that everybody in the world will become very more, much more interested in this health uh, this hazard if we can show that it affects their child's IQ. So this is a um, uh, paper that uh, goes through in fairly great detail all of these uh, health effects and um, thank you very much.